Happy Christmas. Welcome to Ireland Unfiltered's Best Of Special. We've put together a selection of clips from some of the strongest moments in some of the interviews that we've done so far in the series. But we could have picked a whole different selection because there have been so many powerful, moving moments in the series so far. But we'll start at the beginning. We had a long list of names when we considered who we wanted to be the first guest in Ireland Unfiltered. But then we heard that Barry Kilgan was available and we knew it had to be him. Barry is a staggeringly talented actor, but he also has an incredible inspirational story. So we heard late one Thursday evening that if we could get him from Kerry, where he lives, to Dublin the following Monday, he could do the interview. So at 7 a.m. on the following Monday morning, a car picked up Barry in Killarney and drove him to Dublin, and he sat down to do this interview. He spoke about all that he had endured in his life, how it had made him stronger, how acting became the thing that he felt could take him, not away from things, but into the moment. And in the moment, he had a release. But he talked, too, about the people he has met and who have helped him along the way, people like Colin Farrell. And, we st and we'll start this clip with that. Start this clip when he talks about the hard-earned wisdom that he has. That you're this man has wisdom. This man has Yoda, great this is wisdom. This Yoda. He's <laughs> his knowledge. His yeah. you know he's a psychic. He's a no. Nah, yeah, he did. He did say that. But uh, but it does it kind of you have a choice. Like you kind of either sink or swim, basically, mm -hmm. don't you? In those you situations. do. And one thing as well, which I'm very proud of, is the road I took. Yeah. You know, and the road my brother took because in the books it's written. You know, you look at this experience all right, they're going to go down that road, yeah. you know, especially where we come from, the, the lack of opportunities, you know, all of these givens, like, you know, it's, I didn't take that. I could have settled into that and been like, no, F this, F that, you know, I've been through this, I've been through that. I'm going to go down this road and throw a, throw a, a, a you know, a strop. But I didn't. I said, you know what would be good? If I could prove that I can get to the top, of whatever game it is, I want to, I want to play, and that's what I done. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm rising to the top. And were you aware of that at that stage? I was, know? yeah, and I was like, you know, it'd be, it'd be great because it's not heard of, you know, it's not heard of, and that's not only for people in Foster Care. I'm talking about everyone, like it mm. in, in the inner city and stuff. The lack of opportunities, you know, getting kicked out of school and, you know, not going to college, and it, it's all set up for fail. Yeah, you know, and I was like, I can. You know, I'll, I'll make make everyone proud and, and go to the top. And but were there moments when you, because like presumably, like you're you're making choices to do that all the time because mm. the option to do, you know, to go down the other roads are always there. Yeah, there was. Yeah, there was a lot of them opportunities as well. But like for instance, here's an example. You know, staying in on a Saturday night to watch a movie and and and, and study a, an actor or a character rather than go to the pub with all the boys like yeah they were little choices i was making but stood for me yeah you know yeah or staying in to watch a documentary and instead of going and playing a football match mm. you know or going to the cinema on your own which is not a good thing to do i don't <laughs> you look like a creep <laughs> but like you know just to, to see a movie you wanted to see and or just watching like life and you know i was, I was realizing what what it was i was doing and you know, because as an actor, you're always observing and, you know, so doing these kind of things. And so were you thinking about, like, did you, when you were saying you wanted, you were going to get to the top, I saw you thought you wanted to be a boxer. Yeah. You know, but was it like, it was just an ambition to kind of make the right choices rather than any specific path at that stage? Um, yeah, I think it was, you know, as I said, it was, I want to choose a game and, and get to the, the top level of that game, and, and boxing was a hobby. So, uh, like football was a hobby. So all these things were hobbies. Like you know, they were, they were all things I was passionate about. But when acting came along, it was a, uh, it was like a feeling. Like you know, it sounds cliche, but it was a feeling I never got. You know, yeah. it was an undescribed feeling that I never got before, and it was, it was nice. It was weird, but it was nice. And 
you know, and then the perks of that was like, oh yeah, and you're being paid and, and you're getting to be in, on a big cinema screen, but there was something else though that was like, this is, and this is nice. You were seeing your mother every week mm -hmm. and then you were 12 when she yeah, died. Yeah, I was, yeah, about that age. I remember being in school and the class in school was saying at the, the funeral as well, which is very nice. And how did you find out? Um, my nanny. You know, my nanny and my auntie told us. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it wasn't a nice day. Obviously, it was the worst day of my life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was about 12. But I, I, you know, there's something in me that just, just, you know, I just took it and just made yeah. me stronger. Well, there's a, yeah, I, there's a, another book I remember reading of called The Talent Code about, and he talks about the amount of people who succeeded in life who'd lost I've a parent, heartbreak. who'd lost a parent at an early age. Yeah. It's a huge list of people, like artists, writers, politicians. You know, and they've all suffered and some sort of pain. Yeah, and, and he thinks, his idea is that it provides this, um, he calls it, you're, you're, it gives you this idea that you're not safe. Yeah. Right? You're, and it, that creates an energy mm -hmm. that then you put that energy into developing your talent. Yeah. That sounds like... It sounds very similar. Yeah. And What's like that book called? The Talent Code. The Talent Code. Yeah. Uh, and that's like, that's the, ch the, again, the people who realize that and do that, like that's the, again, you know, it, it's, it makes meaning of the worst kind of tragedies in your life, doesn't it? It does, yeah. I mean, because you go to that place of the worst place and you can't go any lower than that, can mm. you? No. So you only go up from there. Yeah. Look at me with my wise words. <laughs> We're getting very wise. We should both lean forward now. Like we yeah, just to lean forward and <laughs> more wise words from Kyogre next week. <laughs> but, um, and then you went to live with your granny. Was that when you went to live with your granny? Yeah, then my granny, they fought for us, you know, because we went to a, a home then where a lot of other children were and run by the daughters of charity and it was called Listio and right. Swords. And they looked after us very well as well now. Um, and yeah, I mean, any they'd come see us every week, mm -hmm. and they were just you know finalizing all the paperwork, all that, and then we moved in. And your brother, the two of you were always together. Mm -hmm. And was there ever any danger of the two of you being separated? Not that I know of, no. And you, I don't think I'd let it happen. No, yeah. he'd let it happen. Yeah, I can't imagine. I'd you bite let one of their ankles yeah. or like you know, get away, me. <laughs> and when you moved in with your granny, then was that like? Ah, oh, that was heaven, you know. Was it? Yeah, because my granny's like, you know, she's my mother's mother, and you know, it's like having my mother again. Yeah. You know, my aunt as well. Um. And it, yeah, I just, you know, it was they really, really like took us in, looked after us, and so all credit to my nanny and, and my aunt and, and my sister as well. And did you feel like you were home? Did it feel like home? I then? did, yeah, because uh, that home is where the. Uh, her ten children were born, like you know, yeah. um, so she's never moved, right? You know, so uh, that was my mother's home as yeah. well. So yeah, it was, it's my home. And all those years in, in in like foster homes, like that must, like must be very hard not to develop a kind of wariness and a suspicion of. Yeah, you definitely, you definitely, you know, you you develop this, this, uh, this. I don't know, like a uh, skill or a, uh, I don't know what, muscle, where you can suss people out in a few seconds, mm. you know, because as, you, as you're a kid, you know, you're, you're sussing these people out as you move in with them and and trust plays a big part in that, especially, mm. you know, giving, giving your trust and being taken away then and trust and so y you develop this muscle where you can um, suss people out. And it must be hard not to develop a sense as well that, you know, people don't understand mm -hmm. what I've been through, you know? Yeah. Like, like I, know my li I wasn't like that young when my mother died, but I, when my mother died, I always found that I was, like, I, I could tell the people who'd been through it from the yeah. people who hadn't been yeah. through it, and the people who hadn't been through it just didn't understand. Yeah, they didn't. You know? No. And, 
No, it doesn't like. But it doesn't make it like you know, I'm better than yeah, you. Yeah, or like, I've been through yeah. like, It doesn't make that. But like, and everybody right. like the, pr the, the 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 thing about life is that everybody ends up understanding because tragedy. Yeah. But like the amount of people who would come to me after they'd lost a parent saying, "God, I never realized." Yeah. What you went through until this happened. Yeah. But like, what was going? What you were going through, which was like so much more extreme, mm -hmm. to not kind of have it hold it over other people judgmentally yeah. must have been like very hard. Yeah. No, and I wouldn't see that because I don't know what you know himself or himself has went through or ourself or I don't know you know and I don't ever want to judge you know um. But like you know, and I don't ever want to go. Oh, my pain is more harder than your pain, or your yeah. like. So it's one thing I I never done, and I don't think I would because it's not fair, is it? You know, you can't read a, a book by its cover, and no. And like looking at me, you wouldn't be able to read this book, would <laughs> like you? I can't read. I look like I'm in prison with this <laughs> Calvin Klein. It's a Calvin Klein. Calvin it? Klein. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you can't tell anything. You'll never know where you're coming from. Mm. Um, you touched on it there. Can you remember the first time you felt with acting that it was going to kind of fill that void or, or take you or be that therapeutic mm. thing? And did it surprise you? Yeah. You know, it's another cliche, but year of every actor going, I was lost in the moment. You know, that's not like, that's not to say like, you know, I forgot who I was and, you know, for a whole day I was this character and I was like, you know, and it's not that, you know, it's like a four second thing. Mm. It's a high, it's a, it's an energy. I'd, I got it once I, I, at the very start and all of the camera crew were outside. And it was just us and the actors and I couldn't see anyone. And just for, for, that, for that four seconds, I was totally present. You know, and by mm. being present, you just forget, you just, you're here, like, you know, you, you don't know what's going on. And I got that and... Where was that? That was on Between the Canals. Right, yeah, the first film. Yeah. And I got that, you know, and I was... I almost forgot to say my line, like... Because I was... You know, I didn't know what was happening. You know, it was yeah. just... But it was a magical, magical moment. And you're chasing that. Every film, you're chasing that. The amazing thing about listening to Barry talking about where acting takes him is that even when he was explaining it, you could see that it was almost taken to that place as he, j as he explained it. So you can only imagine what the actual thing does for him. The creativity and th the process of that was something that Tommy Tiernan touches upon as well. Tommy Tiernan is a guest where you basically want to get out of the way. You can have too many questions, too much of what he said before that maybe you want him to talk about. There were things I wanted to ask him about. Solitude, his childhood, drink, our old friend self-loathing. And we touched upon those things. We touched upon Navin, about his, touched on his childhood, which he said was an unhappy childhood. But first of all, in this clip, we talked about his shed. I love, I've started smoking cigars recently. And I, I have a shed down the back of the garden. And it takes about an hour to smoke a cigar. Mm. And I just, I'm sucking on it. And I just, these lines come to me, mm. you know? And I've always had this feeling, you know, if it takes a drug, it takes a drug. Yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 the, that's the price. Um, <laughs> and I sit down in my shed with a treble espresso and uh, a cigar. And I just, these lines, you know? Mm. And I might only get one line per cigar, mm. but it feels like a wonderful way of passing the time. I came up with this one last week, which was uh, people, of wonder, is there life after death? You know, I'm like, oh, I'm of course there is. It's just not your life. <laughs> 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 and that makes me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm giggling down the shed at that. And <laughs> that seems to me to be uh, a good time well spent. <laughs> yeah. A productive life. <laughs> but talk to me about that, that solitude then, and because you said before that the desire to connect yeah. comes from a place of solitude. Yeah. Is that like, is that the sort of the paradox that? you feel you're sort of dealing with all the time? A place of, um, yeah, probably. Uh, and I love the solitude, so I drive around the country by mm. myself. Um, spend a lot of time down the shed. Uh, you know that great line from Chinatown, uh, where 
Jack Nicholson picks up the phone and the voice on the other end goes, are you alone? And he says, isn't everyone? <laughs> uh, so yeah, it comes from a desire to connect totally. Um, and the mass of an evening, mm. the, the ceremonial uh, thing about being in front of a thousand people and the, the, the ceremony of it, mm. that's phenomenal um, and really enjoyable. Were you always comfortable in your own company? Uh, definitely always drawn to it. I think you kind of you kind of mentioned that you went to a lot of different schools. Mm. I was the same, so I got very used to being the new boy. We went. I went to school in different countries. Yeah, like I started yeah. in Donegal, and uh, then we then I went to school in Africa. Yeah. Do you know? And I was three years in school in Africa. Then I went to school in London. I went to school in Athlone. Went to school in Navan. Went to school in Ballinasloe. So that thing of being, I'm very, that thing of being the outsider and that feeling yeah. of not really belonging. And I love Navan. Mm. Uh, it's a great town of tension, you know. Mm. There's a statue in the middle of it of two lads wrestling a bull, <laughs> and it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and there isn't a, a, a sliver of fat on the lads or the bull, you know. It's a, there's ropes <laughs> and muscles, <laughs> and it just it, it's perfect for the town. Uh, what's the statue for? What's it's story? just an expression of tension. That's <laughs> what. <laughs> we need to we need to mark this somehow. <laughs> <laughs> just erupted from the nav and mind. <laughs> how do we, what's the best, how can we best express <laughs> what it's like to live here? <laughs> and uh, so I think Navin to me was always a verbally violent town. Mm. Never physically violent. There was an, a, an edge of it, you know, but it, to, in my life it never expressed itself. Yeah. But it was verbally tough. And I, I didn't realise how different that was until I went to school in Banlaslow and people in Banlaslow just weren't as funny. Right. It wasn't as tense. They were just supposed to be more relaxed and a lot, lot more kind of uh, easy going and gentle. Which is why Banlaslow has never produced any great comedians. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> it just doesn't have that necessity. It doesn't mm. have that uh, collision in it. Um, there's also a large psychiatric hospital on the outskirts <laughs> of the town, which, which I always thought is great because it gives kids from Ballinasloe just another option. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you don't do so well in the leaving, you go, ah, fuck it, I'll go to Bridget's for <laughs> a couple of years. Um, <laughs> that's always a thing, you know, <laughs> when people were put on the CAO form in Garbley College in Ballinasloe, so some, <laughs> some lads were down UCD, some lads were down at St. Bridget's Psychiatric <laughs> Hospital. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so, so I think Navin definitely, but I do feel like an outsider in the town, you know, mm. uh, and I always have, um, and that comes from travelling uh, so much, yeah. And but you always felt that wherever you were? I think so, you know. Uh, I grew up in, uh, I was born in trouble. Right. But I was born into trouble. Um, so th my parents' house was a tough house. Yeah. It was a house full of tensions, like loaded. The, you know, my mother smoked an awful lot, and there was just this. So I was always more comfortable outside of the house yeah. than I was inside the house. Um, that produces an energy in an individual mm. looking for. If you're not getting the connection at home, where do you get it? I think as a people, I think Irish, we are a tribe maybe born in trouble. Mm. I, th I think we have so many things, issues. We haven't faced up to the famine yet. Yeah. That, that sounds daft and, you know, uh, a bit melodramatic. Um, and it's an easy thing to mm. say. But I don't think we have really. I don't think we've really, it's not something that we, we don't mark it commemoratively. It's rarely expressed mm. artistically. Uh, it doesn't come up very often in conversation, you know. Yeah. There's that fantastic memorial down by the three arena of the the, the skinny people <laughs> heading towards Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's about it, you know. Yeah, it seems to be kind of getting there now. There was Black 47. Yeah, so there's a, it, that's starting to happen, mm. isn't it? That's mm. starting to kind of... Uh, but I remember reading somewhere that even that genetically, um, 
the so uh, that kind of prolonged starvation has an effect on the body and children who are born from that body would carry that genetic effect mm. and that lasts two or three generations so mm. physically people in the who were born in the 40s and 50s in Ireland would have carried uh, a kind of a famine tattoo mm. somewhere yeah. in them you know so all that kind of stuff is so I think those two things to be personally born into mm. trouble uh, and to be part of a tribe that is I think they they kind of produce the need for connection you know? and you know you talk about like I've seen you say that you're still processing your childhood and when you say that what you say there it kind of makes me think that you know we need to not just process our own childhood we you know we also have to sort of start processing our parents childhoods like you know totally, if we're trying to yeah. understand ourselves and forgive them yeah and, and look for the same forgiveness from your own children yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, the, when the time comes. Yeah. Um, we can't always be pointing back to the people who <laughs> reared us. <laughs> All the way back to Adam. <laughs> His fault. <laughs> he, he's pointing at the apple. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm processing a childhood sounds... Uh, it doesn't sound like an interesting mm. experience. Uh, reliving it, maybe. The, the, ghost, the ghost of your childhood is always there, yeah. you know. Um, memories and... I had, an, so I've been working up in Belfast a lot recently and what I do is I drive on the motorway from Galway to Enfield and then I slip left and I drive through Meath mm. as far as Slane and then I'm back on the motorway. So I've spent the past eight or nine weeks driving through Navan at night. I love it. Mm. You know, I drove around the estates where that I grew up. I uh, was able to name houses, you know, Cavanaghs, Hegarty's, Brady's, mm. McGrath's, and great memories of uh, a Navin childhood, great memories of my friends. And I rolled down the window one night and I just parked the car. And I wanted to breathe in the Navin air, mm. you know. And I realised that I didn't have a happy childhood. And that, that, that awareness came to me and says, yeah, I was never, I did not have a happy childhood. Things were too tense at home. And when you say tense, what do you mean? Just full of mm. anger and unresolved stuff. and uh, You know, the, the only thing when you've walked into a room uh, and people have just had an argument yeah. and they've stopped the argument, but you can feel something. Well, our house was like that. We All that, the time. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So um, you're aware of that. Now, I had that feeling I, and a realisation and been able to name it. I did not have a happy childhood. Yeah. But I was able to almost name it without feeling wounded by it or without feeling uh, laying the blame or at angry. anybody. Without feeling angry, without yeah. feeling kind of just a kind of, okay, yeah. yeah. That, that, that was my experience, yeah. you know, without uh, laying any great pressure on mm. it. Just, that was just the way it was, mm. you know. And then I drove to Slane. <laughs> <laughs> you got angry again. <laughs> <laughs> in Lynn Ruan's book, People Like Me, she also writes vividly about her childhood. When Lynn was a guest, we talked about that. But in this clip, we focused on issues not so much to do with her life, although they touched upon them, but on issues affecting Ireland as a whole. The presidential election had just taken place when this interview happened, and Lynn had been a vocal supporter of Michael D. She spoke about Michael D and how he was an anchor, a counterpoint to some of the forces that are rampant in the world today, not just in Ireland, but across the globe. Fascism, racism, and how Michael D stood for everything that is against that, the idea of bringing people together. But we also touched upon Peter Casey and what his vote meant and what her response and what Ireland's response to that should be. Can I ask you about certain things in Ireland today now we, we've just had a presidential election and you know you're a supporter of, of Michael D and uh, he got a you know the resounding victory but people are talking about Peter Casey and the vote he got and the reasons for the vote he got and to me it feeds into an awful lot of the stuff we've been talking about mm -hmm. your book talks about yeah. uh, going back even to when you talk about working in the community and the austerity cuts uh, and the way you know it turned groups against each other mm. because you didn't want your 
you didn't want to be the group that got the cuts. Mm. And if you look at something like the cuts, I think traveller education and, and workshops were cut by about 85% during aus austerity. And now we have somebody pressing that button. Um, what do you put his vote down to? Can it be, is there, is there a simple answer to that question? And also, how much weight should, should it be given? I don't think he should be, I think we should, I think we should be able to, we should be having conversations about what's emerging, not only um, in Europe, but globally. You only have to look at Brazil and, you know, fascism being on that rise, on a rise and, and the politics of division. People choosing to run their campaigns on the basis of division. And I just think that's fundamentally wrong as, as, uh, as not only a political leader or a potential political leader, but as a person and a, and a human being, and it's really broken, you know. I can't, uh, I can't understand why people don't naturally want us all to come together, to bridge the gaps, to see how we can work together, to look for solutions, to look for ways that we can have better life and better potential and understand each other better, while also respecting each other's differences. So when somebody comes with a campaign that's purely based on hate and division, I think they, they really need to go away and, uh, and look at themselves. And I think if you, if w what's happening is, I think because people, you know, want to focus and the media, the media should not be legitimizing, you know, his comments by talk, still talking mm. about them. You have President Higgins who won by running a purely positive campaign and not buying into all the hatred, right? A positive campaign. And I really think that he is the anchor, that counter pull against what we're experiencing globally mm. um, and, and, and at a European level in relation to, to, to fascism and hate and racism. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's really, really sad that, that, you know, the likes of Peter Casey would even get, um, you know, would even get any, any inches in a newspaper mm. in this day and age. And people want to try and tell us, people want to try and convince us that we're politically correct. So you should be allowed to say whatever you want about travellers or about people mm. in addiction, or because that's free speech. It's not free speech and we're not being politically correct. We're just being decent human beings that actually care about people, mm. that actually want to see people do well and not struggle and not just dish out hate, like, mm. you know what I mean? like. And I think we need to stop allowing people kind of frame the narrative. Um, Do you think the media needs, and this is a debate that's going on within the media now, that you know they need to sort of slightly alter their age-old kind of, you know, we are the, you know, just the neutral uh, deliverer of news and we don't, mm -hmm. we're impartial. That actually because things, because of the extremism, that there needs to be a bit more proactive mm -hmm. uh, engagement. And especially whatever, you know, first of all, with his comments, but especially now as well, since he's finished the presidential election, there's no real need to keep going back to that to that well. Yeah. Like he, you know, you have to listen to him while he's running for president yeah. because he's got the, the, the endorsement. Yeah. But there's no need to, uh, and the media has to get involved in choosing which voices to amplify. Yeah, and I think the me like media need to understand their power in um, in spreading narratives and of course while he's running a campaign he he has to be heard but yet like I mean I think I've seen more pictures and articles about him than Michael D mm -hmm. you know and we do need to look at that we do need to look at why we're more interested in entertainment nearly it's like an em entertainment factor for some people mm -hmm. or you know and it's okay to I think it's okay to talk about Peter Casey's vote or why people might have voted but in a constructive way to actually understand or to dissect maybe you know maybe we should be the media should be focusing on say if we're going to look at travelers and peter casey we should, we should be focused on why there's so much of an underspend every year mm. in, in the county council's budget instead of focusing on what he's saying so we kind of seem to feed the, we seem to feed the, the negative narrative instead of actually doing any real journalism in terms of educating um, the country on why certain situations are the way they are. You know, so I think sometimes it's lazy. It's lazy journalism. Michael D said in his, his acceptance speech that it was, he, you know, he, it was a choice between a republic of equality, inclusion and empathy versus extreme individualism. Like, 
on what, what side of the, the scales do you think Ireland is at the moment? I think, well, I think you only have to look at, I think, yeah, like, I mean, we can look at the referendums, we can look at Michael D's vote, right? And we can see a hell of a lot of positive in the outcomes of all of those and where the country is going. But that doesn't ever mean that, the, that, that it won't swing back, mm. right? And that's what we always need to be careful and mindful mm. of. So, of course, there's a huge amount of individualism out there. And that's what I referred to earlier on when people are told that, you know, it's your fault. It's, it's mm. individuals are the ones that make the decision, decisions whether they survive, don't survive, succeed, don't succeed, go to college, don't go to college. That's a real individual, uh, individualistic look. Uh, and what we need to do is we need to be able to, to challenge that because society is... Um, a collective of people mm. and cultures and families and communities, you know, so we should never be looking at us as, as, as an ind individualistic state, you know, we should be focused on, on, on uh, the essence of community. And I think that that's what, that's what Michael D does. And I think people have got behind and, su and support him, but we need to mind that space. And I think the media, politicians, anybody that has a platform, needs to also help mine that space where we're in a much more progressive, inclusive society because it benefits us all and hate and racism and division absolutely benefits. It doesn't benefit, I don't see who it benefits at all, you know, um, because the more, the more you run an individual state, the more people will fail and fall and rely on state supports. And, you know, but if you're looking after people collectively and, and everybody is ri rising at the, same, at the same time, well then you're just going to have a much more peaceful um you know society that's based on harmony and it all sounds very hippieish now what mm. i'm saying <laughs> a harmony and love and peace <laughs> but yeah maybe yeah but and i think michael d represents um a huge amount of what i and many other people stand for i've never came out and bad for a politician like i have for him mm. and it's because i believe in, in who he is and what he says and what he's doing um can you imagine a, an ireland where a story like yours isn't actually isn't a story yeah and i think that's what we should be you know that's what we should be aiming for and i think it's something um i remember when we we're sitting down with, with um grace dias a, mm. a friend of mine and that's what we were talking about about because we'd have similar uh, backgrounds and, and interests me and grace and we were like imagine if like you know we just weren't uh, you know we weren't a story we weren't the working class girl mm. that made or you weren't this and it's saying well that's it that's it that is what change and progression looks like you know, if everybody has the same opportunities and it's not a, it's not like what Faradgar talks about when he talks about equality of opportunity. It's about the equality of conditions, you know, so all our conditions and our environments must look the same for us to be able to even recognise what an opportunity mm. <laughs> looks like to be able to take it, you know, that kind of way. Mm. And I think the more we can move towards that, um, the better. And I think we need to start telling more positive stories. Like there's so many people in, in communities like mine doing amazing stuff. Just because they're not on the telly doesn't mean that they're not successful, intelligent, articulate, amazing people. And we should be celebrating people so much more in working class areas and talking about the work that they're doing and talking about all the different sectors in society that they work in, the arts and culture. And like, I mean, I'm not the only one. I'm not an anomaly, like, mm -hmm. you know, but people kind of want to herald me and use me as a baton or a tool against people that don't succeed as if like, you know, well, she done it, you know, well, like, why can't you, yeah. you know, that kind of way. Yeah. And I don't think that that's fair because there's lots of people doing well. Um, but we all have had, um, you know, we've all just had different, different paths and journeys through life. And mine has just led me to having the platform that I have, you know, but it's not, it's not, it wasn't some personal choice. I didn't just go, I'm going to be a senator and became a senator. Mm. Like there was a whole journey of people, there was people helping me constantly. A lot of people in, in, in communities like mine have absolutely no one to ask advice or information mm. from or help or support or, and they're very much on their own. Ryan Tuberty was a different kind of interview, reflective, wistful, and honest about what he wanted from his career. But he was also honest about how people saw him and how he may have seen himself when, as a 35-year-old, he was awarded the uh, position of host of The Late Late Show. It was funny that we talked about it in those terms because I suggested that it was like an office of the state, 
uh, that more people were interested in who hosted the Late, Late Show than who was Minister for Finance. And I think that's true. But he also talked about how he has a political gene. He comes from a long line of politicians. And we saw that political gene when, when the interview was done. He spent almost an hour in our office posing for selfies, shaking hands, working the room in a way a professional politician would do as much as a professional TV presenter. And you could see in those moments that there, here was the political gene, here was a man who came from a long line of politicians and has that interest in politics, which was something we touched on as well. Um, but in this clip, we started with that ambition and when he first thought that he could present the Late Late Show. I, I, what happened was uh, I got, to, I did a TV, I did the Rosa Tralee program for two mm. years and that was my first time in front of a television camera in any meaningful sense. I did a, a quiz show before that called All Kinds of Everything and somebody passed by and saw me talking to the audience and said, oh, yeah, we're at this guy, uh, let's put him, and then it, the rose happened very quickly. I was going, holy smoke, and, and I think that I've never looked at it back, I never will, uh, and I suspect it was pretty atrocious, but look, it, it was the start. And then they said, okay, uh, t uh, chat show, and the thing called Tuberty Tonight exi mm. existed for five years, and I just loved every second of it, and uh, there was a live band, and it was kind of American mm. style, and it was great fun, and we got these crazy guests from, America as well as locally, and it was lovely. And, you know, uh, but, but I have to say, because I was quite young, I mean, I was only 30 mm. uh, thereabouts doing that. Uh, the thoughts of the, to me, the Late Late Show belonged to older people to present. Yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't a realistic ambition. I thought maybe two presenters later, mm. I might have a pop and I'd be in for a chance, but I definitely didn't. So when Pat Kenny left, I did not see myself in the frame at all. I thought maybe they might go as a, outside bet your man from saturday has air miles let's give him a whirl but i thought they'd never go for it mm. and so you didn't expect it no not for a minute and i can tell you that straight in the eye really not for a second yeah i think that there were other runners and riders um which i won't get into now because it's not mm. fair but but it's other than to say that uh, i just thought other uh, uh, somebody else and i there's two uh, two or three people in my head i thought would have been uh, Pretty, pretty well set up to get the gig. Uh, but did you say you were interested? Did you let people know you what were interested? What happened was there, was co there were calls made and mm. we were and then a few people were invited in for a chat. Mm. Like this. <laughs> but not I've, a got no, I've, got no, I've got nothing to offer you at the <laughs> oh, end. No. But no, it was called in for a chat and to shoot the breeze and, uh, and, and the breeze was shot. Yeah. And did you have any hesitation? Because as you said, no. you're doing a show. No, no, I didn't. No, no, no. I'm not going to cut across you and say okay. no. I'm not going to vacillate and say, oh, you know, I have to think about this for a minute or two. Bang! Right. They said, you got the gig. And I went, wow, I can't believe it. I was sh uh, brought into a room. I was in, uh, mm. what do you call it when they locked lock down? <laughs> and I had my phone and the room and I called my folks and I said, but lads, you're not going to believe this. I called them obviously separately. I said, mm. you're talking to the next presenter of the Late Late Show. And, you know, it was a magical moment. I, I think if nothing else, I was so happy that they were, they were able to take that call and, mm. and, and, uh, you know, and take it, and uh, and they they smiled and laughed and said, "Great," but they weren't they weren't showbiz people, yeah. so they had no great. They didn't want to necessarily come into the show. <laughs> you know, the way people yeah, can have yeah. tickets, can yeah, have tickets. Yeah. They were going, "Great, good luck with that." <laughs> if, if I told them, "Look, I've just ma been made chief engineer on the project to build mm. a bridge," they would have been equally as happy. But but uh, yeah, it was a big day for me. I was very happy. And the imposter syndrome never like when you look back on your first shows and I stuff dread, like. I was I was nervous wreck yeah. I still get nervous on a Friday yeah. night at the end like this mm. this doesn't disappear it's part of the fuel yeah but uh, for those first few uh, shows you know yeah absolutely terrifying um in a really good way um, but I describe it like cold water in the, in the sea it's, and you look at the sea and, and you, maybe you're doing a swim on Christmas morning you look at the sea you go oh, I can't get in there mm. and then you get in and you go at this <gasps> like the first 30 seconds, minute or two, you find it hard to breathe, and then you just go, no, nah, I don't want to get out. Yeah. yeah. It's like that, every Friday. But was there, uh, like, was there a sense of responsibility? Because to me, like the Late Late Show is, again, it's like an, an office of the state almost. You know, Weirdly, even, it is, yeah. And like even, you know, even talking to people in the office today, like, you know, you have to deal with things like, you know, there are people today who are saying, I'll ask, I'll ask them for toy show tickets. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's the kind of the, the, uh, the patronage of the state <laughs> as well. Like it's a similar, it's actually, it, 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 you know. It is, you know, it's funny you should say that because when we go around the country with our radio show, 
and we roll into town for, on the Wild Atlantic Way, for example, whatever, and people come out and you're shaking hands mm. and you're kissing babies <laughs> and you're posing for photographs. And you know something? I love it. I think yeah. that there's a political gene in me that, because they're going, they'll say to, to each other, don't let your man out. There's, there's loads of heads outside <laughs> and he'll take another hour. <laughs> and I'll say, let me out there because yeah. I love it. I mean, I love that. It's like, it's like running for office mm. uh, when you go around the country with the, with the radio show. And equally then, you know, the, the, the Late Late Show. Where was I yesterday? And people, oh, we were filming something. And neighbours in this estate and all, they all came out and they were shaking the hands. Mm. And, I don't know, I just love it. I just love the warmth. When we went to London recently, I walked out of the hall at, at one point and the, just the, the, the warmth, it felt like walking out of the arrivals hall in Dublin airport on Christmas Eve. They were just going, mm. wow, it's great to see. And you know, I love it because you'll get you know yeah, negativity, of course, and I, and I understand that because I'm not always going to be great and I'm also going to be a pain in the arse for a lot of people. A lot of people watching this will be going, oh, your man drives me nuts. I get that. Mm. You're never going to be everyone's favorite person. But if you can be a favorite person for a few people, for this needy narcissist, that's enough. You know, that'll mm. get you by. And the negativity you said earlier, your, your mother always said it was like watching you get into a boxing ring. Yeah. But that was to do with the, the criticism around That's it. That's right. When I started doing the Late Late Show, she said, oh, God. And I said, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and she said, oh, it's just like, it's like watching, it's like, I feel like a mother watching a son get into a boxing ring. And I said, what? And she'd pick up a, a paper and she'd see something mean. And thankfully, she doesn't go online, thank mm. God, because if she thought the papers were bad, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a walk in the park. Uh, and she'll, uh, but things are good now. And you know, uh, she, you know, in terms of things like coverage, you know, people are, you know, it's, it's fair. And if it's negative, it tends to be reasonable. And you know, it's mm. not just out to get them for get them. Do you sake. think it was like that? I thought initially, th I thought people had trouble adjusting. Mm. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm not always. I'm just not going to be everyone's cup of tea. That's just the way it is. Do you think being what were you 35? Do you think being that age when you yeah. got it added to that because people again yeah. they see you they see ambition when they see yeah they cocky yeah smug irritating yeah. all the words that I I, I think uh, I can attribute to myself <laughs> <laughs> looking back <laughs> a little bit now the odd time but yeah I I can see why I I would agree that was 10 years ago. Uh, and then comes age, and then mm. comes life experience, and then comes, um, you know, uh, realizing the good things in life mm. and the toxic things in life, and uh, what you need to be uh, beside and who you need to be near, and, and uh, it's, it's a certain amount of wisdom, uh, loads of experience, and uh, life is, uh, is 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 pretty exciting, and you meet some extraordinary people, and uh, you realize you are a lucky man. You talked about touching on it a couple of times there about online and the yeah. abuse there, and I've heard you talk about it again. I, you were talking about someone last week, and I, you said they should realize, I think you said something, online is sort of for abuse. I like think that uh, it's like that, it was that brilliant scene in the Saturday Night, Lights, Saturday Night Live sketch mm. recently at the Kavanaugh hearings, and the woman who was brought in to ask the few questions because all the grey men uh, that were asking the questions wasn't yeah. said. Remember that woman yeah, yeah, with yeah. the glasses? Yeah, yeah. And Saturday Night Live showed her sitting down. She goes, hi, I'm sitting at this ridiculous table and I'm here mostly for Twitter. They got it. It's, it's like, you know, yeah, it, that, yeah. that sums it up, yeah. you know. Um, so I, what I say about it online, the great thing about online is you can go offline. And mm. that's what I've done. I don't read comments. And you never, like you left Twitter. Left Twitter, yeah. Left Twitter for a number of reasons. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, to use that awful word, there's a narrative that says that I left Twitter because of, I was bullied off. Mm. Or that's nonsense. I'd love to nail that line right. now. I left it because there, that, there was part of it was the, the irritating thing of people uh, constantly at you, which is fine. The, as, mo as, many, as many compliments as negative. But actually, I was spending too much time on the mm. bloody phone. And my daughter turned around to me one day and said, are you on that again? And I went, that's it. I'm not going to be one of those dads mm. who I see pushing prams like that. I'm saying, mm. and I wasn't pram at that stage, but I just don't want to be one of those guys who's glued. I'm on my phone. I'm still on Instagram. Mm. I like it because it's friendly and it's, I don't engage really. I just send out the stuff mm. and I see people uh, react and it's lovely. It just gives me a little insight to another uh, audience that I don't have on TV and radio. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to get into the, the, the rabbit hole of uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook and all that. I have none of that. So or why even WhatsApp, Dion. Like really? I'm not, yeah, because WhatsApp is, in, is insane. Yeah. Because it, you get bundled into uh, groups like you're putting the back mm. of a van. 
right. and told, <laughs> yeah, this is the uh, meet Dion for Joe.ie yeah. uh, group. Yeah. And suddenly there's five people there. And then people take the huff when you don't respond mm. in three and a half seconds. Then the tyranny of the ticks and there's the blue tick and the double tick and the single tick. It's exhausting. So I now text. Have you, so you must have left WhatsApp. You know, you know a lot about it. I, I you know about oh, I was on it. <laughs> you know a lot about the art. Can you not see how exercised I am by WhatsApp? I'm clearly traumatized. <laughs> like, what happened? That happened. I hated it. It was, it was just too much. And I've got, you know, I've got a very small group of friends. Mm. And I said, lads, I know this is annoying because it is. We're trying to organize a pint or whatever. And they have to text me. And, there's five, and it kind of feels arrogant. I said, but look, I just don't like it. I love reading. Mm. I love watching a movie or something. And if WhatsApp is there, you're on it. And you're not reading and you're yeah. not watching. So I just t uh, whittled it all down to a few different apps that, like trying to find here today, mm. was useful to have sat nav. And yeah. So I'm not going to knock you it up. I'll stick mm. with the smartphone, but limited. And so you'd never go back on Twitter? No. Never gonna happen. And do you check it? Do you like? Is it, no, you know? no, I don't. No, and I'm not gonna be, you know, bullshitting you about mm. half checking and half casting a night. Mm. No, hundred percent no. But so do you find you're missing out because a lot of stuff no. happens there? <laughs> no, I don't want to be there. Okay. A lot of stuff happens everywhere. Yeah. I much rather like I find it's hilarious. Like I don't have Facebook, mm. and I find it like. I'm glad people are so in touch with people they haven't seen in school for 50 years and that they know they had a child recently. And I'm being cynical but, and facetious, but I just don't need that noise. I, n I just have a few, few friends, family, colleagues who I get on really well with and whose company I enjoy. That, that's all I need. Mm. I mean, I don't, want also, I don't want to be told you're great all the time. I don't want to, yes, man, I've got that bit sorted out. Mm. I know where I can get the truth from too. So that's enough. And did it, when you got rid of that stuff, did it help you as a broadcaster? Yes. Focus on what's important. Focus mm. on the brief, focus on the guest, focus on the team talking to you. Yeah, it did. Absolutely decluttered. Decluttered? Yeah, it. hugely, yeah. And it was really good, it was liberating. Because you talked about it there, and you've said it before, about how you, you feel you're becoming more yourself. Yeah, that's true. Like, how much of a struggle was that to kind of again because maybe of the burden of the, of this office of the state the office of the state <laughs> they make it sound so grand well, but is there is grand. something weird it about is, it yeah. i agree with you i mean you know, people are more interested in who presents the late later than who's like the minister <laughs> for finance <laughs> well for now anyway uh but uh yeah it is sorry what's the question i missed the question excuse me sorry the question was I'm laughing at the office of the state but yeah no, no <laughs> the sorry. question was like was it you know that process of becoming more yourself when you do this because I will say, for example, when I listen to you on the radio, yeah. I hear a greater range of your personality. Much I more so. You're so right. Then on tele on Can't do it on TV. Why? Because if for some reason it is, it is, you know, it's funny because on the TV, <laughs> I'll be people uh, off TV, whether mm. it's having a pint or, you know, going down the pier for a walk or whatever, and I'll stop and chat with them mm. for ages if they mm. want. Like, I'm mm. not, you know, anyway, I'll chat and they'll go, God, and I know what they're thinking. They're going, God, you are some knob on the TV. <laughs> but you know what, you're all right. <laughs> Leo Varadkar is somebody who probably feels the public perception of him is also very different to the private man. He is shy and it is hard to imagine him working a room like a professional politician, like Ryan Tuberty does. Um, but it's an aspect of politics that he's had to improve on and get better on. In our full interview, we did talk about that. But in these clips, we're going to put together what Vradkar had to say on housing and what Micheál Martin had to say on housing. Both men talked about a lot more. They did talk about, Martin talked about his voyage as a nationalist. Vradkar talked about that aspect of politics he finds difficult. But we focused on housing because it is the great domestic issue facing the country today. This, this debate spilled over then onto the Late Late Show itself when Vradkar was caught by surprise when Tuberty put to him what Micheál Martin said on Ireland Unfiltered about the reluctance of the government to build public housing. But I will start here with me asking the Taoiseach why houses couldn't be built like they were built in the 50s, 60s and 70s. Because we're not in the 50s uh, or 60s and what you had then was a very different setup. Um, you had uh, local authorities that um, essentially were builders themselves. Uh, to build up that kind of capacity in our local authorities, I don't know how long it would take. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would take so long that we would definitely make this crisis worse initially and prolong it in the, in the medium term. So when you do have a crisis, when you do have an emergency, what you need to do, in my view, is to build as many houses as quickly as possible by any mechanism 
you can come up with. And that could be local authorities, and local authorities are building more. It could be housing associations and housing trusts, like the Ivy Trust that built houses in this city for as, for as long as I can remember, and certainly before you and I were born, uh, or by developers. The ideologues who are saying are the ones to say we should get rid of all of that and pursue this one way of doing it, which is direct bills of social housing by local authorities. Uh, and the reality is that if you went down that line of policy, um, you would, it would take so long to build up the capacity in local authorities to do that again, that the problem would get a lot worse, probably for five or ten years, and even then it might can get better. And how... Um, but that's their ideology, so the facts don't matter. Well, look, if you look at something then specific like homelessness, like, do you think, like, the, the figures are, are, are pretty appalling. But yeah, again, talking to people about this, they say, you know, with real action, those numbers could be reduced. If there was a true will to kind of tackle it, they could be reduced because it's an appalling situation, whatever way you deliver housing, that, hmm. you know, one of the legacies you're going to have is that people will grow up under your government having spent their childhood in emergency accommodation, the damage that's going to do to people. Hmm. Surely that involves taking... Uh, taking action that actually, you know, is is different, is yeah. is radical, and uh, and I'd you know I'd argue that we're doing that. Uh, take for example, rough sleeping. Um, this time last year, certainly eighteen months ago, there's a huge focus on the number of people who were rough sleeping in in this mm. city in Dublin. Um, that's down about forty percent. Uh, and why is it down forty percent? Because we pursued this housing first model, uh, getting people off the streets uh, into housing, but wrapping a lot of different supports around them, working with the NGOs to do this so they don't, they don't lose um, the accommodation they're in because often people who are rough sleeping have a lot of other problems, mental health problems, uh, addiction problems and so on, and that has been um, very successful. If you take the number of people who are in emergency accommodation, which is in the region of around 10,000 now, uh, we took 5,000 people out of emergency accommodation this year. Unfortunately, there are more people coming in. And because of the whole uh, family hubs, and again, a huge investment has gone into family hubs, the average time that somebody spends in emergency accommodation is now six months. So mm. children, are, there may be, there are extreme cases, of course, and exceptional cases, um, but children aren't growing up in emergency accommodation. The average time you would spend in a family hub is six months. I appreciate, for various reasons, there are exceptions. In some cases, people have been offered housing and have refused it. You'll always have a certain number of exceptions. Um, but they're the kind of things we're doing. I know it's not enough. I know we haven't turned the corner yet. Um, but I think when we get the supply going, when we get to the point where we're building enough new homes and apartments every year to meet or exceed demand, uh, then we'll really be able to get on top of that issue. And you think you're doing enough because, like again, it does seem, I know you'll say it's, a, the, it's this radical socialists mm -hmm. who, who are wedded to an ideology, but like it does seem that, again, you, you feel that you can kind of just stick to a plan that you have rather than saying this is a, a generational crisis. And, you know, like Dunkirk was a, an emergency and people didn't say, let's schedule another ferry. They, they got, they did something drastic. And people look at what the government is doing and think drastic action isn't being mm. taken to get these people out of emergency accommodation. I, 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 well, I'm not, not sure I said we're doing enough. Um, I think we need to do more. Uh, but there are limitations on what you can do. Take, for example, the budget that we just passed a week or two ago. That provides for a 25% increase uh, in in public investment in housing next year. Um, that's a pretty big increase. Some people, some people say, oh, you should increase it by 50% or 100%. Um, but that doesn't actually necessarily mean that you would build more houses because there are real constraints. You know, land has to be serviced. There's a limited amount of concrete in the country. There's a limited number of construction workers. Um, uh, because of the mistakes that were made 10 years ago, um, we saw a construction industry collapse, uh, a banking sector collapse, and we're still recovering from that. And you know, the solutions that I see other people putting forward, um, they may sound radical, but where's the evidence that they would work or work any quicker? Like, do, are you really saying to me that um, you can just turn around and write a letter to Wicklow County Council and tell them to build 2,000 houses? Like, that's, that's, that's fantasy then. Yeah, it's the one I get most ang angry about. Uh, this morning before I came up here, uh, I would have had a clinic in, in, in Mahan in Cork. And what people don't get into statistics at all is the number of uh, young mothers, for example, um, who are living with their kids with their parents. Mm. I mean, you can now have uh, 10 to 11 people in a house now. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not homeless. Mm. They're not on any statistic. Mm. But they're there. And they're waiting and waiting. We've people 10 years on the waiting list. Mm. Decent families trying mm. to get a house. Um, so I just don't understand. 
and I go back to what Fianna Fáil stood for in the 30s and the 50s, we built massive housing estates. Mm. There seems to be a kind of a genteel... Do you think they can't do that anymore? Upper middle class change. resistance to building local authority houses. At, at is that all it is? I don't agree with that. I think it, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, no question there's, a, there's a, an element of that in it. Um, and uh, we have huge money spent on HAP, mm -hmm. which is renting private houses. We're chasing this private sector, doesn't have enough houses. So mm -hmm. if everybody's after the few houses that mm -hmm. are there in the private sector, so the young couples can't buy a house. Mm -hmm. The price is too high. Young people starting in low starting salaries can't rent in mm -hmm. Dublin or in Cork or Galway or Limerick because the rents are too high. The younger generation mm -hmm. is the one generation in, a life, in, in recent decades that is suffering and yeah. whose future is no longer perhaps as clear as it might, be, it might have been for earlier generations. You, so car insurance, trying to put a car on the road yeah. for a young person. If you're getting your job in Dublin, mm. how many times are you going to get back? The cost of rent here, how much do you have left at the end of the week? These are the issues that we're getting, you know. But they also lead to, does the government realise the volatility that that can cause? Like there's a lot of uncertainty in people's lives and you, you see these housing protests, you see that it is causing a huge amount of anxiety uh, uh, beyond just the people most directly affected it's and do they underestimate maybe the volatility that, that can bring into the political system they do they do no question they do uh, they think they can manage their way through this for the next couple of years <coughs> a bit like the health crisis as well mm. i think Fine Gael have given up on health they just think health will always be with us mm. almost approach and on housing uh, i don't i'm not sure they understand the scale of it mm. still uh, in terms of how it's impacting not just on those who can't get the house, but the entire family, mm. the entire family, uh, the mothers of the of the mothers, so to speak, yeah. um, and the fathers of the fathers are, anxious, are are very very worried and concerned about what the future holds for their young people if they can't get a house, um, and they're in very poor conditions. And we have to be careful about our interferences in the market as well. I mean, we were all for the re rent pressure zones, but I have to be honest with you and say what's happening now in clinics is people are coming in with the letters because there are exemptions to get out of the rent pressure mm. zone. So people are coming in with letters saying, you know, from the landlord saying I have to repair and refurbish the house, therefore I'm giving an mm. expiry date for the person to leave. Or another, other letters legally written saying we have to, we're selling the house, I hereby swear I'm selling the house mm. and I have to um, give an expiry date for the person to leave the house. Uh, and so in some respects it seems to have accelerated some of the evictions which is only exacerbating the um, exacerbating the, the, the crisis even further. And then we shouldn't be afraid to do more on the supply side. Mm -hmm. We did some, we, we pushed for tax relief, increases to keep landlords in, 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 in the system, um, and to make sure that maybe a person with one house or two house might be incentivized to start renting out the house, because we, we desperately need supply, uh, and, it's in, and it's not coming quick enough to meet the growing demand for houses. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode of Ireland Unfiltered with Ireland's world champion, Kelly Harrington. But our final clip today is from Tommy Tiernan's interview. Christmas is a time, hopefully, of family and friendship and coming together. And we're going to end with this. Tommy talking about his friendship with Gay Byrne, with Michael D, and why old men are drawn to him. Ordinately fond of you. Yeah, a lot of old men are. <laughs> right. I swear to fuck, these owl lads, just him, the president, there's a few other ones, they're just mad for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, at <laughs> I'm an attractive proposition to older gentlemen. Well, you're I always have been, I have always been. <laughs> men, just older men, always just, they like to touch me. <laughs> <laughs> Not any of the men we've just mentioned we should probably No, but the, the president, he, he's very, he always, he, I have great chats with him. And it's always, it's not shocking to people from Ireland because uh, we live in such a egalitarian society. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knows everybody. Uh, but I, sometimes if, I'm, if he phones me and I'm with some English people, I'm just, it's the president. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, how are you, Tommy? <laughs> Is that you? You, you start all this <coughs> conversation with him. I pick up the phone and I go, hello, because it's a, a ID with hell. There's number, yeah. <laughs> unknown number. I know it's him. I go, hello. <laughs> and he says, Is that Dr. Tiernan? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but I've always been, um, uh, and I enjoy their company, yeah. you know, uh, very much so. But I've always been. But is there a protective thing there from them? I have no idea. I couldn't, uh, without a lawyer present, <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't dare. Uh, but I very much enjoy their company. A very and and um, yeah, talking to Gabo and uh, Michael and others, and there's a few others as well. Really, 
And do you a privilege, yeah, like and do you feel there's a kind of mentorship or a father figure thing there from your side of it? Maybe, but I, you, you could you wouldn't even you wouldn't you'd be afraid of destroying it by trying to understand mm. it. You just yeah. the company of it. Yeah. And the storytelling of it. And mm. you know, uh I'm blown Michael D's intellect is and it is astounding. Mm. The stuff that he's able to speak fluently on and knows about and the way he's able to define things. Like he was a sociology lecturer for years and he, he gives these amazing speeches. He's such the wisdom of the man is profound. Mm. Uh, and there's an, a, an awful, beautiful gentility uh, to Gay Byrne that I just, it's just he's, there's quiet in him and there's fierceness in him as well. It's, um, they're men that I'm, I, I love spending time with, you know, mm. rather than trying to understand it, I just, you know, and it, they always ask to touch me and I let them, <laughs> you know, that's okay. <laughs> <Surprise> <laughs> <you pay. laughs> now, Tommy. Now. <laughs>